Welcome back. Grab your Bible and turn to Psalm 55. We're going to launch from there today and actually be in that Psalm most of our time together today. Last week, I shared about Peter walking on water and how we need to keep our eyes focused squarely on Jesus. Well, this week I experienced what it feels like to be affected by the wind and the waves as I truly began to sink beneath that water. It's amazing when you preach something, you're going to be tested on it virtually immediately. This week, for the first time this past week, I began to feel a heaviness settle into my soul due to local and national events and social mandates that we're all experiencing. But it was compounded by some truly jaw-dropping and ludicrous uh, decisions that are being made by our city leaders here in Seattle. And so I felt myself sinking. And I felt the wind and the waves of the world that we're living in. And, and amazingly, and as the Lord does it, in that condition, he supernaturally directed me to the passage of scripture that I'm going to share with you today. This is really more of a journal entry of what the Lord showed me during my quiet time on Wednesday than anything else. So I want you to turn to Psalm 55, 22, and there's one verse that I want to focus on today, and it is simply this verse, Psalm 55, 22. It reads this way. It says this, cast your burden upon the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never allow the righteous to be shaken. I'm going to read it one more time. Grab hold of this. Let it sink into your soul. David says this, cast your burden upon the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never allow the righteous to be shaken. This chapter is a declaration by David as he is literally running for his life from his own son, Absalom, and from his best friend, Ahithophel. The two have joined an evil uh, created an evil team and are conspiring against David to kill him and steal his throne. And if you were to define Psalm 55, there are two basic words that define it, anguish and anger. David is in anguish that the son that he loves, Absalom, and his closest bosom friend have literally joined together to extinguish him from the planet and take over his leadership, the leadership of Israel. But he also feels anger as he reflects on the mind-boggling deceit and treachery that has been employed by these two, uh, these two people. And as I studied the context of this, the impact and the importance of verse 22 was magnified dramatically magnified. For this verse is David's final conclusion. It's his bold declaration at the end of all of this anguish and anger that he expresses. It's a bold declaration of how he is navigating this most gut-wrenching time of his life, the darkness that he's walking through. And in this verse, cast your burden upon the Lord for he will sustain you. He will never allow the righteous to be shaken. There is one exhortation and two promises. And I want to walk through these together with you uh, as we study the word together. So firstly, the exhortation, and that is this. Cast your burden upon the Lord. Cast your burden upon the Lord. Again, the context being tormented state darkness, oppression, anger, and anguish of spirit. Cast your burden upon the Lord. Burden here was shocking when I understood what it meant. It literally means the lot in life that God has providentially given you. It is a picture of the plate of your life that has been loaded and handed to you. The lot of your life. 
Cast the lot of your life onto the Lord. Our burdens, every burden that we have, everyone, first of all, has a burden, but they're all unique. Everyone's burden is a little bit different. They're like a fingerprint. No one's is the same. But the thing that we all have in common is that we all have one. Everyone has a burden. Everyone is carrying something. Everyone is experiencing something. We might look at somebody else and say, well, their burden is a lot lighter than my burden. Their lot in life has sure fallen in much fairer places than mine. But the reality is everyone is carrying a burden. Everyone has providentially been given a lot in life. And here is the principle that is really one I've wrestled to get my mind around Believe it or not, after spending all this time in the word hours, I could barely get my mind. Here's the principle. That which God has given to us, we are to give back to him. <laughs> that which God has given to us, the lot in life, this gift of our life, in all of its color, blacks and whites and every color in between, we are to give back to him. Listen to what the old cigar-smoking preacher of London, C.H. Spurgeon, said years and years ago. Here's what he says. He says it this way. What God lays upon you, lay it back upon the Lord. His wisdom cast it on you. It is your wisdom to cast it back on him. He cast your lot for you. Cast your lot on him. He gives you a portion of suffering accept it with cheerful resignation, and then take it back to him. And the principle is this, return to the source. God is our source. Here's the illustration that Jesus gave. He said, he gave the illustration of the vine and the branches. John 15, the vine and the branches. And here's what he said. He said it this way, I am the vine, Jesus said. You are are the branches. He who abides in or attaches to me and I in him, he bears much fruit. And then he concludes by saying this, apart from me, you can do nothing. Nothing. What does nothing mean? It means nothing. <laughs> apart from me, if you're not attached to me, if you are not bonded to me, you can do nothing. And the principle again is that God is our source. God is not our backup plan. God is not our emergency exit, our contingency plan. God is our source. He is our plan. God is our plan. Years ago, there was a poem written by a gentleman named William Ernst Henley, and likely many of you have read it. This was written by a man who did not understand this principle. Here's how the poem goes. It says this, Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud, under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloodied but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade, and yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll, I am the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul." penned by an unconnected branch. These words, as inspirational as they may seem, are absolutely ignorant of the reality of life. That is that God is our source. Even for those who do not know Jesus, do not understand that he is the vine and that we are the branches. He is still the source. James says that all good things, all good things come down from above. No matter whether we know Jesus or not, if we are blessed, that blessing came from God, came from heaven. Scripture says that it rains, that rain that causes the crops to grow on the just and the unjust. That is God's grace on everyone. 
whether you know him or not, he is the source. Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Through Christ who strengthens me. David said it this way in Psalm 20 or Psalm verse uh, chapter 18. He said this, for by you, O Lord, I can run upon a troop. In other words, I can defeat an, an entire army. And by my God, I can leap over a wall. The God who girds me with strength and makes my way blameless. He makes my feet like hinds feet and sets me upon my high places. In other words, he makes me able to run up and down a cliff like, uh, like, a, like a bighorn ram. So that he trains my hands for battle so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze. <laughs> for you have girded me with strength for the battle. You've delivered me from the contentions of the people. You have placed me as the head of the nations. David understood who his source was. So let's answer the question, how then do we cast our burdens upon the Lord? I want to give you six ways. Six ways. Number one, we cast selectively. We cast selectively. Go to verse 16 of Psalm 55. We cast selectively. David says this, As for me, I will call upon God. I will call upon God. He does not cast his burden on everyone that he runs into. He casts his burden on the Lord. He goes to the Lord. He doesn't vomit on everyone who will listen and vent on everyone who comes across his path. There are kind of two extremes to this. You have the person who's just angry and uses everyone as their whipping post. I was talking to a brother the other day and uh, sharing some of these, these scriptures with him. And he said, yeah, unfortunately, there's a guy in our men's group. He's like that. He just unleashes his fury and frustration on all the guys in the group every time. Then you have uh, those that every time they see you, they want you to join them in their pity party. Oh, woe is me. Life is just horrendous. And they just want to vomit all of, all of their spew. David doesn't do this. He doesn't poison the well and he doesn't throw a pity party. He is a dealer in hope. David goes to the Lord, gets the strength of the Lord, and then is able to encourage us through passages like this. Napoleon said that leaders are dealers in hope, not in despair. Brothers and sisters, there's a spiritual muscle that we must develop that is a muscle of self-control that directs me to the Lord and away from people and potentially maybe to one or two others selectively to cast our burdens on. The Lord is always first. As for me, David says, I will call upon God, not I will vomit on all the people. So firstly, how do we cast? Selectively, I go to the Lord. But number two, we cast verbally. Verbally, in 16, he says this, as for me, I shall call upon the Lord. I shall call upon the Lord. You notice he did not say, I will think about the Lord, or I will think about God. He said, I will call upon the Lord. Verbally, we cast verbally. Look at verse 1 of chapter 55. David is a, an aggressive pursuer of the Lord. He says this, Give ear to my prayer, O God. Do not hide yourself from my supplication. What is supplication? Supplication is prayer that has sweat dripping off of it. David says, give ear to me, Lord. Give ear to me. Listen to me. I'm praying with passion and fervency. Then he says, give heed to me. Pay attention to me and answer me. I am restless in my complaint and I am surely distracted. In other words, my mind is pacing. It is filled with commotion and chaos and turmoil. Lord, Listen to me. Pay attention to me. <laughs> he calls to the Lord verbally. Brothers and sisters, listen, listen, listen. My ears and my mind need to hear my mouth declaring that I'm casting my burden onto the Lord. My ears and my mind need to hear my mouth declare 
I'm casting my burden onto the Lord. There's a little chorus that I learned. I don't know when I learned it or who taught it to me, but I learned it years and years ago, and it goes like this. I sing it to myself often when I'm in a time of anxiety or even despair. It goes like this. I cast all my cares upon you. I lay all of my burdens down at your feet. And any time I don't know what to do, I will cast all my cares upon you. There is power in declaration. There is power in declaration. My ears and my mind need to hear my mouth declaring, Lord, I am casting my cares upon you. So I cast selectively. I cast verbally. But thirdly, I cast quickly. And I call this the hot potato principle. The word cast literally means to throw, to hurl, to fling, to shed, or to throw off or throw down. It brings to mind the picture of a hot potato, getting rid of that burden as quickly as I can. I wrestled all through high school, so what I'm going to share with you isn't personal to my experience, but I remember watching the basketball players as they warmed up uh, practicing a drill. They would get, I believe it was in a box, each one of them would have a basketball, and they would pass that ball as quickly as they could. As soon as they received a ball, they would pass it because the next ball was on its way from the person in front of them. They catch, they pass. They catch, they pass. They catch the pa- catch and pass. And the goal, of course, was that you had the ball in your hands as little time as possible. And that's what God is saying here. I catch that burden and I pass it to the Lord. I catch, pass to the source. Catch, pass, catch, pass. Hot potato. Hot potato. I cast quickly. What happens if we don't pass the ball? (laughs) What happens if we get our eyes on the wind of the waves? We start to sink. Listen, the burdens that we're talking about here aren't meant for us to be carried by ourselves. If we're going to live that supernatural life, walking on water, it requires that we don't have that extra burden. We catch and we pass. We catch and we pass. And we've got to develop the spiritual discipline and the discernment and the awareness of when there's that inner pressing, when there's that sense of heaviness that begins to settle into us. Proverbs 12, 25 says this, anxiety in the heart of a man weighs it down, but a good word makes it glad. Anxiety weighs it down, but a good word makes it glad. I go back to number two, declaration. Say, Lord, I'm not going to hold on to this one. I'm casting it. I'm casting my care upon you. So we cast selectively. We cast verbally. We cast quickly. But then we cast continually. Look at verse 17, I believe. It says this, Evening and morning and at noon I will complain and murmur. Evening and morning and at noon. Friends, we cast continually. Brothers and sisters, we cast continually. Continually. 1 Peter 5, 7 is the New Testament equivalent of Psalm 55, 22. And it says this, Cast your cares upon him, for he cares for you. And in the Greek, the tense of that verb, cast, means to cast and keep on casting. Keep on casting. Keep on casting. Because these burdens tend to come back. They tend to find their way back home like a boomerang. And we have to cast and cast. The the basketballs just keep coming. And we have to catch, pass, catch, pass. Continually. (laughs) Continually. This is not a once and done interaction. This becomes our way of life. Catch, pass, over and over and over and over again. And now we understand what Paul was teaching when he said, pray without ceasing, because Lord Jesus, I'm casting, I'm casting. I can do that dozens and dozens and dozens of times a a day. And I find myself praying my way through the day, casting my cares upon him, going back to the source. Lord, here I am again. Lord, here I am again, casting my care on you, hurling my burden back at you, passing the ball, hot potato, selectively, verbally, quickly, continually, and fifthly, candidly, candidly. It says this in verse 17, I will complain 
and murmur and he will hear my voice. Complain and murmur. That is a bit surprising. Complain and murmur. What does complain mean? It means to ponder, to communicate, and to question. C.H. Spurgeon said it this way, we may complain to him, but not about him. <laughs> There's a line. God can take our complaining and our questioning. That is the beauty of this amazing relationship we have with God and with Jesus Christ, is that we can dialogue with him. We can complain to him. But even more than that, <laughs> the word murmur literally means to sigh, to moan, to groan, to mourn, to cry out loud, to growl, to snarl, to rage, and to roar. Everything from sighing to roaring. And the picture of this, this verb in the Hebrew language is of a hornet's nest that has been poked and prodded and threatened. And the hornets are, they are furious. <laughs> and they are murmuring. And they're about to come after you, frankly. But that is the picture we have in this word murmur. Listen to what Matthew Henry said. He said this, grief, great griefs are sometimes noisy and clamorous. They're like a, a hornet's nest that's been poked. And thus are in some measure lessened while those griefs increase that are stifled and have no vent given to them. Let me read it again. Great griefs are sometimes noisy and clamorous and thus are in some measure lessened. When we are willing to go to the Lord and to do everything between sighing and roaring, that grief is lessened. That is part of the human experience that God says, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Part of that rest is moaning and groaning and sighing and raging and snarling and roaring. Take your pick. It's all legal if we're casting our care upon the Lord. <laughs> it's all good. But when we don't vent, he says, while those griefs increase that are stifled and have no vent for them, when we just push it down, it often is a sign that we're holding on to those burdens. We're going to try to figure it out. And those are the burdens that crush us and push us under the waterline. I don't know if you know or have experienced this, but for me, the Christian life has not been some happy, clappy joy ride to heaven. It has been a battle, <laughs> continues to be a battle. And Romans chapter 8 says that all of creation groans under the curse that this planet has experienced. We're, this planet is cursed, brothers and sisters. That's what the Bible teaches. And all of creation groans. And then it says, we too groan, waiting to be released from this curse. There's a groaning, and if you're like me and getting older, there's a creaking going on in our bodies as well, in our joints. Your eyes don't see as well. I hate these glasses. I hate wearing glasses. There's this big obstacle. I'm always dodging and ducking around my glasses. <laughs> we come to the Lord candidly. It's not often pretty. It's not dignified. It might not sound religious or poetic, but Jesus can take it. Everything between sighing and roaring he can handle when we cast our care upon him candidly, but finally confidently. Number six, confidently. We cast our care confidently. Listen to verse 18. He says, You or he will redeem my soul in peace from the battle which is against me, for they are many who strive with me. Verse 19, God will hear and answer them. God will hear, and it literally means will humble them, will afflict them, because they do not change and do not fear God. Four times in verses 16, 17, 18, and 19, the word will is used. David uses the word will. God, the Lord will save me. He will hear my voice. He will redeem my soul in peace, and he will hear and humble them. Confidence. We can cast our burden confidently onto the Lord. Confidence means a rock-solid belief based on evidence. Listen to what David says in Psalm 27, verse 13. He says this, I would have despaired unless I had believed, unless I was confident that I would see the goodness of God in the land of the living. And I would have too had I not believed that I would see the goodness of God in this life and the life to come. I would have despaired. 
you would despair. But we can come to God confidently, confidently, and cast our care upon him, cast our burden onto the Lord. And now we come to promise number one. It says, when we do this, he will sustain you. The word sustain means enable me to endure. It literally has the, the, the visual picture of helping me to keep it together. When I lifted weights in high school, we would put on a weight belt, when we, especially when we were lifting heavier weight, and that would just pull together our core and keep anything from popping out. It would keep us together. <laughs> and it would allow us to be able to lift so much more weight safely. That is the context or the sense of sustain. God will bind us together. It also means he will give needed support or relief. He will supply with sustenance. He will nourish. And to the far extreme, he will provide and protect and defend us. That is all included in this word sustain. And that is exactly what happened to David. In, in the story, 2 Samuel chapters 14 through 19, that's exactly how God interacted with David. David cast his burden, and here's what the Lord did. He protected him. He provided for him. He defended him. He fought for him. He confused the enemy, and then he restored him back to his throne. And he'll do the same for you. The promise of the word of God is that if you cast your care, he will sustain you. But the second promise is that he will never allow the righteous to be shaken. To be shaken. That means to be dropped. To be moved or dislodged or uprooted. In other words, the tree of your life might be rocked with violent wind, but you will never be uprooted. You will stand firm if you cast your burden upon the Lord, you will not be cast down. There is a church that I love, that I go to and pray in often. It is on the route that I walk. I have about a 35 minute route that I walk and I use that time to pray and just Spend time with the Lord. It is, uh, but this church lies on this route. It's St. Mark's Catholic Church. And many days it is open and there's nobody there. And the lights are low other than the light coming through the stained glass. It's beautiful. It's peaceful. There's beautiful pictures of Jesus. And there's a large periphery that I walk and I just walk laps and, and I pray and I talk to the Lord and I think about scripture and it, on the west side of the building, there's a little spot where you can kneel and pray. And there's a picture of Jesus. And at the bottom of the picture, it just says simply, Jesus, I trust in you. And often I'll come and I'll kneel there and I'll just kneel in front of that picture and just recite that statement. Jesus, I trust in you. And brothers and sisters, the last verse of this chapter, David says this. But thou, O God, will bring them down to the pit of destruction. Men of bloodshed and deceit will not live out half their days, but I will trust in you. I will trust in you. And that is my encouragement. We cast our burden upon him, and we trust that he will sustain us, and he will not allow us to be shaken. He is our source. He is our source. He's our strength. He is the vine. We are the branch. We get our nourishment, our sustenance, our strength, our wisdom. Everything we need comes from the vine, from him. Cast your burden upon the Lord. He will sustain you. He will never allow you to be shaken. Amen. Father, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We worship you, oh God. You're so good. We thank you for your word and for this powerful encouraging, inspiring word from you. Lord, may it just penetrate deep into our hearts and minds and change us. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you, and we will see you next week. Have a powerful, inspired, burden-casting week. God bless you.